It has been said that the best and most beautiful things in the world cannot be seen or even touched. They must be felt with the heart, through emotion. But is emotion purely a human construct? Something that cannot exist apart from the human psyche? Or is it something else altogether? Can it permeate into the world around us? Such are the questions posed by tonight's story. Another fantastic one from Dr. Creepen's Vault, the subreddit I set up, so you could share your stories with me and I could read them all to you. Now once again, it's time to sit back and relax with your favourite drink, and listen. I used to underestimate the power of zealotry. That doesn't mean I was completely naive about the power of fanaticism. I was 11 years old when the Twin Towers fell, and mixed in with the hours spent watching cartoons and sports, I watched the news with my parents and learned of suicide bombers. During my teen years, I lived with the threats of school shooters and bombers, and learned to be careful with my after-school activities, for I never knew when a cop might think my skin was too dark and shoot me on sight. Yet it wasn't until my time spent in Oklahoma during a summer break from college a few years ago that I was taught how far a fanatic will go for their ideals. I grew up in New York City, in Queens. My mother is Native American and can trace her heritage back a long way. She is Cheyenne, and her family was one of the many families that were forced to move to new lands due to the Medicine Lodge Treaty. She was living in Concho, Oklahoma, when she met my father who was passing through on a trip across the country. She was a waitress in a diner, and my father happened to stop in for a cup of coffee. I've been told it was true love at first sight. My father is the very definition of a wasp, a white Anglo-Saxon Protestant. He was traveling across the country during the summer break at Dartmouth, where he had only one more year left till graduation. He's told me that as soon as he laid eyes on Mum. All the money, prestige, and the future he had laid out in front of him disappeared, and he knew in that moment that this woman was the one he wanted to spend his remaining years with. He almost gave up everything to be with her too, but my grandfather was not going to let his firstborn son drop out of college. So, he made a deal with my mother and father. My father was going to graduate and get a well-to-do job in his field, if he did that, then my grandparents would allow my mother to live with them while my father finished college, and they would even pay for the wedding after my father got a job. My father fulfilled his end of the deal, and my grandparents begrudgingly fulfilled theirs. In 1987, my parents were married, and three years later I was born. Growing up in New York, I didn't get much of a chance to meet any of my family from my mother's side. We didn't get many opportunities to travel due to Dad's work, and Mum had mixed feelings about going back to her home. Every once in a while, I would talk to my aunt or uncle via phone call, but that was it. It was clear, even without my mum talking about it, that there were memories of experiences when she was growing up that she'd rather forget, and I didn't want to be the one to bring them up. She was perfectly happy with Dad, and even though she wasn't as gushy about her feelings to him as he to her, more than once she told me she fell instantly in love with him, the second she laid eyes on him too. When it was time for me to start college, I wanted to leave the Northeast and experience the country. I decided I wanted to go to the University of Texas in Austin, and while my grades were pretty good, my dad's money helped seal the deal. So, I loaded up the car my father had bought for me, and drove across the country to Austin. The level of freedom as I made my way through different states on different highways was intoxicating. After arriving at my destination, I made myself a personal and unbreakable vow that once a year, I was going to take a road trip to some other state I'd never been to. At winter break during my freshman year, my parents flew me back to New York to spend Christmas with them. During this time, I told them about how wonderful driving down to Austin had been, and that I was planning another trip for when summer break arrived. As my dad happily chattered away at me, I noticed my mum had taken the pose she did whenever she was deep in thought when I mentioned my planned trip. 
later that night, before I made it to my room, she stopped me in the hallway. Why don't you take a trip to Oklahoma to visit some of your family? I know you never got the chance to meet them in person growing up. And I think it would be a great opportunity for you to learn more about my side of the family. At that point, the thought of that had never really crossed my mind. My father's side of the family was never very comfortable with my mother and me. My uncle, aunt, and cousins never said anything racist out loud, but well, wasp families are the kings of microaggression and of passive aggressiveness. It didn't take very long for me to realize that everyone from my father's family, except for my dad, looked down upon mom and me, and probably wished my dad had never gone on that fateful road trip. Because of this, I had been happy for years just thinking of mom and dad being, well, my only real family. Maybe it was the leftover wonder of discovery that still resounded in my soul. But when Mom suggested visiting my Native American roots, the idea sounded great. It would be fantastic to finally meet some family that didn't wish I'd never been born. Plus, I'd been told over and over the family history on my dad's side from stuck-up old white people. Learning history of a family that was here far before the Mayflower landed kind of excited me. I told Mom that I liked her idea, and she told me she would make arrangements with family to give me a place to eat and sleep. Time passed, and after I went back to school, my mom called a few weeks before finals. She told me that my uncle had moved to Cheyenne from Concho, and I was going to stay with him. She said he was more than happy to allow me to board with him, and was looking forward to finally meeting me after all these years. By that point... The pressure of school and having a social life had made me forget all about visiting her relatives. Some of my new friends had invited me to their summer house back in Southern California for a summer of partying, and that sounded a lot more fun than spending time with family I'd never met. Yet, I couldn't bring myself to tell her to cancel the visit. I knew she really wanted me to meet her side of the family, to learn about the history of her bloodline. I decided then to make a compromise. I'd go visit my uncle in Cheyenne for a week or two, and then drive out to my friend's house and make up for time lost. I talked to my friends about this, and they were perfectly fine with it. They assured me they weren't going to be going anywhere, and they'd keep a lookout for my car, and a 30-pack cold for when I pulled into the driveway. So, finals came and went. The last day of my final when I knew I had no more school obligations, I hopped into my car and started driving up to Cheyenne. It's only about a seven-hour drive, and I didn't think my uncle would mind if I showed up late at night. I wouldn't even be getting in that late. I left at 3 p.m., and so I wouldn't be pulling into his driveway any later than 10.30. My mom had told me he was a pretty hip dude, so I guess this was going to be the first test of how hip he really was. The drive up was typical and boring. I did end up stopping around 8pm to grab a bite to eat. While I stopped, I gave my mum a call and asked her to give me my uncle's phone number so I could call him with an ETA. She informed me that he doesn't have a phone, but he's a tried and true night owl. So as long as I didn't get in at an ungodly hour like 3 or 4, he would still be up and waiting for me. This surprised me a little as my uncle had to be in his early 60s, and I've never met someone that old who stays up past midnight, but I've never been one to judge a book by its cover. I got back onto the road and continued my journey into the night. I was travelling up US 283 and was already in Oklahoma when I spotted flashing red and blue lights a mile in front of me. Pulling up, there was a massive, and I mean massive, car accident. Multiple vehicles were involved, including a semi, and you can guess that when a semi is involved, shit was serious. So, I had a choice. Wait around at a complete stop with a few other cars on the road for God knows how many hours, or try to find an alternate route around. Being young and impatient, I decided to turn around and find another way. 
It wasn't far down the highway when I saw an unnamed road that Google Maps confirmed would connect with a series of macros that eventually would get me back on track to Cheyenne. And so I took it. The back roads were really a test of my driving skills. By now, the night was pitch black. No moon hung in the sky, and these back roads had no light posts or anything. They also weren't in the best of condition, and I had to go way slower than I wanted to in order for me not to pop a tire from one of the many potholes that littered the road. I've driven on crap roads before, from a couple of trips I've made through upstate New York, but there was one thing about these dark, desolate roads that set me on edge instinctively. The night was completely silent. I'd been driving the whole way with my windows down because well, I like the feel of wind on my arms and face. While I obviously couldn't hear the sounds of nature cruising down the highway at top speed, going pretty slow down a back road at night should have allowed me to at least hear the crickets or cicadas. Yet, the only sounds I heard was the rumbling of my car's engine and my tires against the road. Some small part of my mind was questioning why that night was devoid of typical nighttime sounds, and worrying about the answer to that question. But the rest of my focus was on driving in the dark and making sure I didn't go off the road. After many twists and turns, going from back roads to even more back roads, I finally reached OK 47, with a big sign pointing east to Cheyenne. I breathed a sigh of relief and finally got back on track to getting to my uncle's house before the damn sun rose. It was already 11.30 at night, and I didn't want to sleep in my car or piss off my uncle the first day of two weeks I was supposed to stay with him. It was nice that I could finally go a decent speed on a road that wouldn't threaten to pop one of my tires every thousand feet. As I was finally making up for lost time and getting closer to Cheyenne, I came across a sign illuminated from my high beams. It said, Washita Battlefield, National Historic Site, Visitor Center, with an arrow pointing left. Seeing this sign, I decided I had to make a quick detour from the trip, and I was sure my uncle would understand. My mother had drilled into my head the history and significance of the Battle of Washita River since I was little. She called it a different name, however, the Washita Massacre. I'll give you a brief summary. The United States' most famous failure of a commander, Lieutenant Colonel George Armstrong Custer, led an attack on a Cheyenne camp under the leadership of Black Kettle on November 27, 1868. Custer claimed that a raiding party who had previously attacked white settlements were taking shelter in the camp, and so ordered the 7th Cavalry Unit to attack. To this day, it is not exactly known the precise amount of deaths the Native Americans suffered, but two things are known for sure. One, Custer said that, in total, 103 warriors were killed, and this is a lie. And two, far more women and children were killed than men. I wanted to stop and pay my respects. I'd heard stories from my mother about the massacre since I was about seven years old. Growing up in New York, my public education had taught me about the many mistreatments that the early settlers had forced upon the natives. I was taught about the Trail of Tears and the Wounded Knee Massacre, and while those events resonated with me somewhat, more than the average student who wasn't part Native American, nothing had ever really hit home because I wasn't part of those tribes. Yet here was an event that did have something to do with me. The blood of my people was shed on the shore of that river, and here was a chance for me to honour them, a chance I might not get again for a very long time. I took the left when it came up and pulled into the deserted visitor centre parking lot. I turned off my car and got out, breathing in the night air deeply. It was cool and fresh and enjoyable. I walked to my trunk and got out a big mag light that I carry in my car at all times. Turning it on, I briefly glanced at a few signs that showed where Black Kettle's camp was, and made my way over to it. As I reached the site, I took in what sights I could from the light of my flashlight. Nowadays, there's nothing there but a river and plants, 
I could easily imagine the land being filled with lodges, where women and children bustled about with their lives, and most everyone wanted to live in peace. Even if they were forced off the land, they'd held for hundreds of years. They wanted peace, and in the early dawn, a man led a charge into this place. And now the blood of my ancestors would forever stain the clay of this earth red. Staring out over the sight, my brain suddenly produced the thought that the night was still just as silent as when I'd been on the back roads and a sudden feeling came over me abruptly. This was a feeling one gets that defies any natural explanation. You see, everyone has an instinctual fear still in their brain. When there's silence in nature, our instincts tell us that a predator is nearby, and the fear kicks in. But what I felt right then, only a few people I've talked to have ever experienced this reaction. It's the feeling your body gets when you are in the presence of evil. I'm not talking about abstract evil, like coming face to face with a murderer. I mean evil in a primordial sense, like something that has no shred of humanity or goodness in it at all. It's a soul-chilling emotion, and I felt it for a few seconds before I heard a horse's snort right behind me, and then blackness enveloped me fully. I began to open my eyes, and immediately closed them as pain washed over my head. I brought my hand up to the side of my head, and felt warm liquid matted in with my hair, which turned out to be my blood. As my senses came back, I realized I was sprawled out on the ground on my back. I was cold, and felt grass under my arms and legs. I decided to sit up, fighting the dizziness and pain that buzzed within my head. I slowly opened my eyes and gazed at the world around me. It was still very dark out, and I noticed that my mag light was still on and off to my side. I cautiously got onto my feet. My vision swam slightly, and it took some effort to keep balanced. I took a few steps and bent down to retrieve my flashlight. As my fingers curled around it, I heard the whinny of a horse from somewhere in front of me. Cautiously, I lifted the light source and shone it in the direction of the sound. I froze in absolute horror when I saw what my light illuminated in the black of night. It was hard for my eyes to make out, and even harder for my brain to process. Just at the edge of the light about seventy feet away, were riders. There were about twenty of them, lined up in a tight formation. The horses seemed like they were made of shadow. They were black, so black that they stood out against the natural darkness of the night. The edges of their forms, like hooves and manes and tails, shimmered in and out of reality. Only, their eyes weren't black, but red and glowing, like a neon red glow stick, but only so much brighter. The riders upon the horses' backs were very different from their steeds. While the horses were seemingly made of shadow, their masters were made of fire. Yet though they were made of fire, they shed no light. Blue flame covered their chests, legs, and heads in the mockery of a uniform. White flame covered their hands like gloves, and tiny sparks of gold were dispersed like buttons and signets across them. Only their heads were not wreathed in fire, and I saw bleached skulls and empty sockets staring back at me. Within the group, I could see one of the riders held a pole with a flag upon it. I could see that it was an American flag, but you could tell that some of the stars were missing. There was no wind, yet it was flapping wildly, as though there were huge gusts of winds blowing it from the side. As I stared at the thing, a change began to come over it. The red bars began to bleed over the white, and took on the slimy look of muscle. The white bars began to mold into teeth, and formed hate-filled grimaces. The white stars within the blue came together to form a white circle. 
the blue drained, leaving the space it occupied black and pooled into the center of the white circle, forming an inhuman eye. It held its gaze upon me, and I could tell this flag now formed a mutilated face that looked upon me with nothing but hatred and rage. All of this was happening in complete silence. As the face finished forming, one of the riders near the middle of the line had his steed take a few steps forward, separating him slightly from the group. He reached to his side and drew forth a sword made of silver fire. In theory, it seemed like something an angel would wield. Yet I sensed this weapon burned not with righteous justice, but with unholy malice. As the demonic rider raised his weapon into the air, something in my brain clicked, and I recognized what was going on. They were about to charge. I turned and ran as fast as my legs would carry me. Adrenaline pumped through my body, and my head wound was far forgotten in my flight. Behind me, I could hear a raspy shout, with a voice like grinding steel. Charge! I could hear the thundering of hooves behind me, with shouts and whooping and gunshots ringing in the air. I was fleeing back to where I thought my car was parked, not even bothering about trying to see exactly where I was going. As I ran, and the sound of the riders from hell was growing closer, I also noticed a chorus of screams all around me. I could tell they were the shrieks of women and children in abject terror. They were mixed in with the shouts and gurgles of the stabbed, the shot and the trampled. Horror and death surrounded me but I dared not lift my eyes from right in front of me for fear of tripping and falling, sealing my doom. I continued sprinting until I finally saw the parking lot in front of me, with my single car standing like a lone sentry. I reached my vehicle and flung the passenger door open, thanking God I decided I didn't need to lock my car. Turning around, I quickly flipped the door lock and stared out the passenger window, in anticipation of the riders in flame to come crashing into my car. The empty night air was all that greeted me. I looked from side to side, aiming my beam of light from right to left, looking for anything or anyone from what had just occurred not thirty seconds ago. There was nothing but night air and the chirping of crickets and cicadas. I continued sweeping with the light, making sure that nothing was going to pop out of nowhere and get me while my guard was down. After a few minutes with nothing happening, I maneuvered into the driver's seat and started my car. I didn't even bother putting my seatbelt on and peeled out of the parking lot. On my way out, I glanced in my rearview mirror. There was one tall black shadow watching me go. It was the one rider who held the flag, and in my mirror, I caught one last vile glare from the face of the flag. A glare filled with the want to rape, murder, dominate, and exterminate. Never once in my years of dealing with racism and bigotry did I ever receive a look that was filled with such evil and viciousness. Its one eye locked with my eyes. It was all I could do to force myself to return my sight to the road in front of me. As I turned the corner and left the battleground, one last scream penetrated the night. The scream of a killer that had just seen its prey get away. My memory's a bit hazy afterwards. I know I got to my uncle's house. I know he was waiting for me on the front porch. I remember seeing his horrified face as I stumbled out of the car and wobbled towards him. I know he helped me into his house and laid me on his couch. I then must have passed out, for the next thing I knew, I opened my eyes to the light of day and the songs of birds and traffic outside. I spent a few days recovering on his couch. He told me a doctor friend of his had come and checked me out. I had a few stitches in my head, but the cut wasn't too bad or deep. 
He'd also had a family friend come and make sure the wound wasn't infected. I asked him why the doctor couldn't tell if it was infected or not, and he told me his family friend could find infections that modern doctors could not. I didn't press him after that, as I was still recovering from my ordeal. I found in the days spent recovering that my uncle was a really cool guy. He did ask some typical questions like how my mum was and all about my life growing up in New York. But we also talked about a lot of other things, like his life and his many hobbies. I found out about my grandmother and grandfather and how life was like for him and mom growing up. I'd expected my uncle to be a little more stereotypical Native American, but I felt a little ashamed when I realized this was the furthest from the truth. After a few days, I finally got up the courage to speak with my uncle about what had happened my first night in Cheyenne. As I started, he held up his hand to quiet me a minute before disappearing into the kitchen. He came out with two glasses of whiskey. I hadn't seen him drink a drop of alcohol the entire time I was there, but he handed me a glass and told me to continue. I gulped down the whiskey and told him what had happened. Throughout the story, whenever I would glance at him, his face never lost a looking of concern and understanding. When I finished telling him what had happened, I asked him, What the hell was that? Who were those men? Why did they want to kill me? Throughout my story, my uncle had never taken a sip of his drink. Now he took a big gulp and paused in thought. Finally, he answered me. A lot of people talk about human emotion like it is just that. Human emotion. They think that humans are the only ones who can feel complex emotions and that those emotions are contained within humans. That's a common theory about ghosts, that they are humans whose intense emotional ties to this world keep them anchored here. But I have found that emotions are not explicitly tied to mankind. We come from the earth, and we return to the earth. When we return to the earth, we bring everything that makes us, us, with us. My uncle shifted uncomfortably. When a man's soul is filled with so much hatred, with an unquenchable thirst to kill men he deems deserves to die, that hatred burrows into the very ground. It festers in it, corrupts it, passes its enmity to the very soil in which it resides. My uncle gave me a sorrowful look. What you encountered was the hate of men made permanent. They lived the lives with souls blackened by loathing, and they have tainted the ground upon which they died. They could sense your blood, our blood, and the want of your fear, your despair, your death, drew them from the ground to appear before you. They wanted to infect you, to infect you with the endless malice that gives them form. That was why I had to bring my friend, a very strong and wise medicine man, to make sure you weren't infected by their sinister taint. I couldn't face my sister if she lost you to them. I pressed my uncle for more info but he refused to speak more of it, just making sure to warn me never to visit the site alone and at night again. The next week was spent trying to forget about whatever had happened, learning more about my family and seeing the sights of Cheyenne, the few there were. Eventually, my time with my uncle came to a close. He saw me off with a smile, and I promised to come visit him again soon. I then left Cheyenne for Southern California and didn't look back only remembering my uncle's last words to me. Remember, only love can ever heal the scars of hate. When school started back up, I decided to switch my major, for I knew what I wanted to do with my life. I became a therapist and a social worker. In the few years since graduating, I've traveled across the country to the poorer parts, offering up what services and help I can. My New England wasp relatives are less than thrilled about my career choice, but I don't care what they think. 
I'm doing my part to spread love and relieve suffering, and my mother and father are both proud of what I've become and what I do. I've even been able to go back to Oklahoma and meet my grandfather, grandmother, and a few other relatives. But there's one place I'll never go back to. One place where I know that no amount of love will ever heal the hate. A place like an ugly scar upon the earth, where the desire to kill those of native descent seeped into the ground from the blood of twenty dead cavalrymen dressed in blue. Their raw fury and want to kill, manifesting itself over a hundred years later. I've talked to others about trying to bless the land, or at least bring it to peace. But I've been told that previous attempts have ended in disaster. Honestly, the reality is I'm too scared to force myself to go back to that place. The place where my nightmares take me every moonless night. Back to the place where a single eye scans the plains, looking to impart its hateful gaze upon me once again. So I don't know about you, but I love that one. I thought that was absolutely brilliant. Another one shared with me via Dr. Creepin's Vault. So it's just a quick reminder. If you've got a story that you think you'd like me to read, why not submit it to the subreddit? I can't promise I'll read it, but I'll definitely give it a go. Give it a chance. Can't say better than that, can you? Well, <laughs> that's enough for me for one evening. But of course, I will be back again with you very, very soon. And I know you're going to join me. Yes, you are, aren't you? Yeah. Okay, then. Till then. Sweet dreams and bye-bye. Thank you so much for choosing to spend your time listening to me. Now, if you enjoyed the Dr. Creepin experience, then come find me on Facebook. Come chat with me on Twitter. Listen to the background music and download it if you like on SoundCloud. Drop by the store, pick up a t-shirt. And, importantly, if you've got a story you'd like me to read, send it to Dr. Creepin's Vault, the subreddit I set up so that I could read your stories. Now, looking forward to seeing you all again real soon. So, come check me out, okay? <laughs>